exalted, the name of Jesus lifted, and the body of Christ is edified. This is the fourth Sunday in the year 2021. Today's Old Testament scripture will be taken from Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12, and the New Testament from 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verses 29 through 31. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my deliverance and my honor. A mighty rock, my refuge, is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. And the balances, they go up, they are together, lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. The end of the first reading. The New Testament reading is as follows. 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verses 29 through 31, reads as follows. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, 
Let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Let us pray. Lord, I want to serve you in all that I do, but in order to do it, I need the right attitude. Well, you can do the right things, but your motives can be wrong. Remember, it's not what you're doing, but it's the spirit in which it's done. So search me, Lord, through and through, and take out anything that's not like you. Heavenly Father, your people come before your throne of grace at this time to give you thanks. To give you thanks for being the God of our salvation. To give you thanks for looking beyond our faults and not only seeing our needs, but meeting our needs over and over again. Father God, we ask that you continue to be with us and bless us as only you can. As we bring our problems, our fears, our frustrations to you. Speak to us, O oh God, where we are as we are. Help us, O oh Heavenly Father, to do the things that you would have us to do. Father God, we pray for this nation and all the leaders. We pray for those that are careless and are concerned about your will and your way. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you bring them out of darkness into your marvelous light. We pray for those that are bereavement at this hour, confident by your most Holy Spirit. Let them know, Lord God, that you're too wise to make a mistake. And Heavenly Father, you too just to do wrong. Father God, we just thank and praise you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you've yet to do for us. We thank you, Lord God, for just being the God of our salvation. We thank you, Lord God, for being a God that not only hears prayers, but answers prayers. So move on behalf of your children, Lord God. For this is your service prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. After this sermonic selection, our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James Abels Jr., will come to us with a sermon topic entitled, The Kingdom of God is Near. I've been through the fire. I've been through the flood. Broken in pieces and left all alone. But through it all, God blessed me, and through it all, God kept me, and I still have a praise inside of me. Yes, I.
Good morning and welcome to the St. James Baptist Church, the church where God is exalted, the name of Jesus lifted, and the body of Christ edified. We thank you so kindly for coming this morning to worship with us in spirit and in truth. And we pray that God's blessing rest upon each and every one of you in a very special way. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made and we are rejoicing in it. We have many things to give you thanks for. We thank you for the gift of grace and the gift of mercy. We thank you for the gift of health. We thank you for the gift of life and life eternally. Bless this worship experience this morning in a very special way. Let me pray that uh, when we go about our usual vocations, that you will bless us to be a blessing to all those that we encounter and embrace, as that you would crown us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and then give us a zeal to represent you in a way that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, beloved, is the fourth Sunday in the month of January. The month seemingly is slipping away from us. Be that as it may, there's a word from the Lord this morning that I want to share with you uh, that never slips away. I want to talk to you this morning from the gospel that's penned by Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Mark, chapter 1, verses 14. Through 20, and I shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The end of the reading. Beloved, I want to talk to you this morning from the theme, The Kingdom of God is Near. The Kingdom of God is Near. If Mark were a Broadway play, then the first 13 verses are like the overture. As we come to verse 14, the curtain is about to go up on the drama. And when it does, we see Galilee. We are not in a bigger city like Jerusalem or Sephora or Rome. No, little old Galilee. Today it would be like expecting to see some drama unfold in New York City or Los Angeles, only to have the story zero in on some place called Outbank, North Dakota. Now, Outbank, North Dakota is a place I've not been. Uh, I imagine it is a very nice place, but it's not what we were expecting. It reminds me of a scene from the classic movie, The Philadelphia Story, in which Catherine Hepburn plays the haughty East Coast, sophisticated Tracy Lord. At one point, she meets an earnest young woman who tells Tracy that she's from Minnesota. With a dismissive, if not vaguely bored, tone in her voice, Tracy says to the woman, Ah, oh, yes, Minnesota. How nice. That's west of here somewhere, isn't it? In other words, you from nowhere, aren't you, dear? Or at least nowhere that counts. That's the reaction Galilee might have garnered from the sophisticates of Jesus' day. It's not the kind of happening place where one would expect a great drama to unfold. But as the curtain goes up on the active phase of Jesus' ministry, that is where
where we find ourselves, even as Jesus, far from initiating some grandly unique message, basically tears a page of John the Baptist's book to declare, repent, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near. Now we've heard this before. That was John's message. But we thought John was the warm-up act. He had said so himself. So what's the main character doing when reprising all of that? Jesus called this announcement the good news. But at this precise moment as the story begins, the message itself is sufficiently thin on content as to make it difficult to discern what's so good about it. The kingdom, we are told, is near. It's not here. It's not fulfilled. It's not crashing in to replace the dim and sometimes grim realities of this world. Not doing anything over it as of the moment to solve even something as locally important as the occupying presence of the Romans in Israel. Something appears to be up. Something is in the wind, they would say. But just what that something is, well, we are not told. But Mark does not give us a chance to ponder that for long as the story moves right along. Right along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. However, the drama portion of it all is hardly enhanced as Jesus calls to his side four simple fishermen smelling of fish and looking every bit like the working class folks that they were, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, hitched their wagons to Jesus, still nondescript program, and began to follow him. Jesus does not tell them where they are going. Beyond some cryptic promise to become people fishers, he also does not tell these for the specifics of what they might expect to happen next. He certainly does not promise them riches or rewards or anything tangible whatsoever. Yet, they follow, but their doing so hardly is the stuff of great promise or portent. It is at once striking and quite probably revealing that Mark's version of the gospel story gets off to such an humble, modest start. Matthew has his mysterious star in the east and the magi who follow him. Luke gives us layer upon layer of drama surrounding the birth and later appearances of Jesus. And John, well, John brings us to the realm of the galaxies and the beginning of all things with that all creating word of God who was with God in the beginning. But not Mark. No, sir. Mark allows Jesus merely to appear from out of nowhere, emerging only from the heat vapors emanating from the desert floor to be baptized by John. And then, at the very moment when we do expect the curtain to rise on the drama to come, we end up in Galilee, even as Jesus starts to cobble together a set of followers that can be described only, and perhaps at best, as ragtag. This is the beginning. Mark already told us that. As many scholars have noted, it's tough to know what Mark meant in this opening verses about the beginning. What constitutes the beginning? How far does it extend? Is the beginning the first eight verses of the gospel? Does it extend through the 13th verse? Does this lecture of Mark 1, 14 through 20 round out the beginning? Or is Mark more clever than all of us by basically saying that the entire gospel from Mark 1 through to the end of Mark 16 is but the merest beginning of a gospel that finally knows no bounds? Glory to God. There is a reason why we find Jesus in Galilee when he utters his very first words in Mark. Because these are the humble trappings that match the gospel ministry Jesus is launching. Galilee is the place 
where most of us live. Most of us live not in the citadels of power or in the glare of the bright clean lights of history. No, sir. We live in the Galilees of the world, on the margins, in those places where the powers that be do not visit and that they do not know much about more often than not. We start in Galilee because the Galilees of this life and the civil fisher folk who live there are the places and the people Jesus came to save. And so, when we come to the gospel's climax and we listen to the angels' words to the women at the now empty tomb of Jesus in Mark 16 and 7, you must go to Galilee, for there you will see him. Now we as readers of the gospel are actually being directed back to Mark 1 and 14. We need to go back to Galilee, back to the humble beginning of the gospel and the humble mundane characters who inhabited to see all through new eyes. And once we have been to the cross, toward which Mark drives us all throughout his gospel, and once we have seen the victory of God at the empty tomb, we go back to Galilee and all it stands for to realize in you that such a place is what Jesus redeemed. Glory to God, my brothers and sisters. The victory of Easter that the angel proclaimed in Mark 16 directs us back to Galilee to realize that the cosmic victory is always finally a very local victory, a very local reality. It comes to Galilee and to all who live there. It is a gospel and a victory for them, for the fisher folk for the outback, and for every last one of us. And thanks be to God. Yes, thanks be to God for Galilee. Because Galilee is where most of us live most of the time. How good it is to know that just there is where we again and again find Jesus proclaiming the good news. And as his disciples, we are called to follow him, to emulate him, to emulate him in this chaotic, confused, and evil world. We are called to represent and represent Christ to this dying world. We are called to share the good news, to share the gospel, and tell the glad story. We are called to proclaim the message of our Messiah, regardless of the times regardless of the days, regardless of our situations or circumstances, we have a message to proclaim. And that message is one of good news. The message we have to proclaim and to embody and to exemplify is the same now as it has always been. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. And so today, as much as ever, people need to know that this kingdom is real and available. They need to see the joy and the possibilities of that kingdom first in us. Because all too often, people are too easily satisfied just to do with what is quick and easy and cheap. Some people settle for sex or liquor, or drugs, or other distractions. They look to these things to save them, or, or at least to help them move forward in a grim world. But as C.S. Lewis once wrote, we are far too easily satisfied. We are like a child who turns down an invitation for a day at the beach, and chooses instead to stay sitting in a slum alley making mud pies. Just because the child really can't imagine how much better a day at the shore can be. What could be better than making these slimy mud pies? The child might think, but ah, oh, my brothers and my sisters, ah, oh, if he only knew. If only he knew 
that the kingdom of God had come near. If only he knew that God had performed his promise, that God gave his son to save us from our sin. If only he knew that while we were yet in our sin, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. If only he knew that Jesus saved to the utmost. If only he knew, though our sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. If only he knew that God forgives all sin and bless us to start again, to start afresh, to start anew. If only he knew. Yes, despite what is going on on Capitol Hill and despite what is going on in the world and around the world, despite what we are experiencing in and through this perilous and unprecedented time, Open your ears, open your hearts, open your mind, and open your spirits to hear the good news. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Spread the tidings. All around, Jesus saved, Jesus saved to the utmost, to the utmost, to the utmost, Jesus saved, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Jesus saved. Glory be to the Father and to the Son into the Holy Spirit. Amen. services via our church's website or you can watch us on Facebook where we encourage you to leave comments regarding today's message, share the video with family members or friends, or even start your own watch party. Please remember to join us via Facebook Live on Wednesday, January the 27th at the hour of 7 p.m. for Bible study. Thank you to those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry despite these trying economic times. If you would like to give, Please send your check or money order to St. James Baptist Church. Or you can give online through our church's website using Givenify. To learn how, 
Please watch the short video. Givelify is giving simplified. Givelify is the simplest, most beautiful way to give and track donations to the place of worship or charity of your choice. You're not limited to the cash you have on hand. There's no need to write checks, and there are no complicated forms to fill out or text message codes to remember. Givelify automatically pinpoints your location and intelligently identifies the fundraiser, worship service, or conference you're attending without the need to search. Since Givelify automatically detects where you are, making a donation can be completed in as few as three taps. Tap 1. Use one of the pre-configured denominations to choose your donation amount. Tap 2. Select the campaign to which you'd like to contribute. Tap 3. With your stored credit or debit card, complete your donation in one tap and get an immediate donation receipt. Setting up recurring giving is a simple two-tap process. Tap the frequency you'd like and you'll never forget to make your gift. Givelify lets you easily see your complete donation history. Mark the place of worship you normally attend as your home for quick one-tap access. Givelify. Tap. Give. Done.